This is a conversation with the author Will Storr about the stories we tell ourselves, the unwritten scripts running our behaviour, and the subconscious games we play with ourselves and others. This voice we've got in our heads, its job is literally to tell the story of our lives, to take information from within our bodies and from around us and tie it to, and look at, and to watch our behaviour and to tie that into a heroic story. And that that voice has no direct access to the real reasons why we do what we do and why we think what we, what we think. It's all a story. It might be true. It might not be true. It's, it's almost certainly not wholly true. So, 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 so that was what really led me down this path. I just thought that was mind blowing, to use a bit of a cliche. This idea that this storyteller in our head is kind of bullshit, it's a bullshitter. It's kind of making up these stories. It doesn't know what the truth is. We talked about his books, Selfie, The Science of Storytelling and The Status Game, and how the modern world has warped the communication networks that have always been an essential part of human culture. I think the reason that people don't understand how catastrophic it is, is when you look at the evolution of psychology, how essential gossip is to us. Gossip once kept our tribes together. Gossip, moral outrage, punishment, rewards for selflessness. Um, when, our community, when our communities became too big, we invented moralistic religions and God took over, you know, God was party to all the gossip and you'd get your punishment and rewards some, you know, in some religions in life, in other religions after death. After God died, in, uh, we, the media took over. The media became our gossip network. The media is obsessed with high status people doing, doing bad things and, and, you know, fermenting moral outrage. Now that's collapsed and now the internet is our gossip network. And I think the internet is a terrible gossip network. It's, it's, a, it's a disaster. And I think you only understand how disastrous it is when, when you understand that, that it is our gossip network and that gossip networks are essential to human society and human function. They always have been. We also talked about how nearly everything we do can be seen as a status game. And if we want to break out of tribalism, maybe we need to create a new one. You need to design a, a status game in which the status is rewarded for, as you say, talking across lines, um, being able to hold two conflicting stories in your head at the same time and sort of busting through that seductive, incredibly seductive, morally drenched story about the world that, we, that our brains want to tell and, and do the effort of, um, of seeing the other person's story. I hope you enjoy this conversation and we're hosting Will for an online event in our digital campfire on the 8th of November to talk about these ideas. So if you want to join that, then check out the membership options in the show notes below. Will, welcome. Thanks, David. So you're an author. You've written quite a few books that overlap with quite a few of the things we've talked about on the channel. Um, you wrote The Science of Storytelling. You've recently written another book called The Status Game and we'll touch on both of those in this. And I guess the central concerns or the central interest that you've got in both is to do with sense making, like how we make sense of the world, how we position ourselves, what are our real drivers behind the stories that we tell ourselves? Are those stories kind of innate in us or how, what's our relationship to the stories? So I'd love to start with what's the exploration you've been on over the last, say, couple of decades? It's really about the brain as a storyteller. I mean, that, that, that's the nub of it. Uh, so in my book, The Heretics, The Heretics was asking the question, how can really smart people end up believing crazy things? That was published at the time of the new atheism and skeptics. Uh, and the broad story that the skeptics told at the time was that they're just stupid. They're stupid people and we're smart people. Um, and I was skeptical about that. So, 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 so the heretics looked at that and it looked skeptically at the skeptic new atheist movement too, um, which was controversial at the time. Um, and, and really, yeah, the, the answer that I kind of came to was that the, that the brain's the storyteller and, and, the, it, and specifically it tells a, a healthy brain, tells a heroic story about the world. And that's what it wants to do. It wants to get you out of bed in the morning, get you believing that you're morally better, that you're right about things um, uh, and, and turn you into the hero at the centre of the universe. And that's what a healthy brain does. It's slightly delusional. And, and what that means for sense making is that the brain is just very good at uncritically accepting any fact it might come across that flatters that heroic story and at batting away uh, any, any fact it might come across that threatens that. And, you know, really powerful forces. The brain is a storyteller. It's telling that story all the time. So, so, so that's where kind of that idea, um, for, for me anyway, um, came from. And yeah, the my next book, Selfie, I, I kind of followed that breadcrumb trail. And that's much more about culture, about how the story that we are 
it comes from our culture. You know, we are, we are kind of products of our culture and, and it, was, it was a book mostly about Western individualism. Um, so, uh, and then the, the, the science of storytelling is a kind of summation of both of those books. You know, you know it's the science of those books pushed together. And, and then what I wanted to do with the status game um, is to say, okay, so the conscious experience is a story. That's the conscious experience we have of the world. But what's really going on? What's the unconscious reality beneath the story that's, perhaps, you know, and, and so the idea that I pursued, again, it's an idea that I talked about in both of those previous books, was that because we're tribal animals, we want to get along and get ahead. So connection and status, that, you know, bonding into games and then competing for status within them and against rival games. So that, in a nutshell, that, that's the journey I've been on over the last sort of 15 years. Mm. And there's an interesting question that comes up when you say, like, what, what are we oriented towards? In, in the idea of like sense making, making sense of the world, do we, do we want to make sense of the world or do we want to find narratives that make us feel better? I mean, I've got my view on that, but and I think we're sort of, in some ways, we've got orientations towards both and they're sort of in compete, they compete inside us. But how would you, because you can end up in a very nihilistic place if you say, well, actually, the human brain is not kind of oriented to find truth. Mm. It's actually oriented towards status or towards dominance. What, what do you make of that? Okay, so a couple of things. So, so, so I'm, what I think is, you know, first you've got to separate out the, the kinds of facts that we're talking about. Because most facts we don't really argue about in the way that we argue about some facts. So, so you know, things like the length of the Mississippi River, you know, measurable facts, the, you know, the nature of gravity. Of course, some people argue about those things. Um, but, um, so, so, so there are those, the great majority of facts. Um, um, but then there are, there, there are these kind of narrow class of facts that we just go to war over. Um, and I think those are the facts that we kind of plug our identity into, um, that, that we, kind of, we, we kind of gamble our status on these facts being true. And I think it's that narrow class of facts that we end up going to, literally going to war over, you know, you, you know, and you look back in history. And in terms of your question about what are we oriented towards, um, we're obviously very good at rational thinking when it comes to how to catch a rabbit, how to measure the length of the Mississippi River, but the incentives have to be there. Um, and, um, and sometimes the incentive between gaining status and learning the truth, that thing, that those things kind of measure up and that, that's humanity at its best. And in, in, the, in the status game is a kind of very condensed history of the world from the perspective of um, status. And so the broad thesis of the status game is that um, um, you know, there are three different ways that we, that we kind of compete for status as humans. There's, there's dominance, um, threat and coercion, um, but there's also these prestigious forms of status that really, the, 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 the kind of the, these are the things that make us human. So we, we compete with, with virtue by being good, selfless, generous, rule following and rule um, 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 keeping people. And there's also success, competence. And, and what defines modernity for me was, was this thing that happened um, uh, in, beginning in Western Europe um, where um, uh, groups began to form that specifically attached status to the, to, to, to the discovery of truth. And it began with this thing called the Republic of Letters, which, which, was, which exploited this kind of quite very sophisticated mail service that was across, across Western Europe. And it began as this aristocratic pastime where it, began, it just became very cool to, to, to know about the world and to swap ideas and to have theories about how trees work and, you know, sumptuary laws and things. And so what would happen is that they would write, write up these ideas in letters and pamphlets, send them across, and peers would check them and they'd argue about them. And um, this was the first time that status specifically has been attached to the discovery of useful facts. And, and, and that, that Republic of Letters became the Enlightenment, which, you know, the Scientific Revolution. And, and so to me, that's, that's modernity. That's, that's the, the, this conquest of success games over virtue games. So, 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 so yeah, so, so, so to, to answer your question in brief, we, we, you know, we can be very, very good at discovering truth when we are directed specifically at the discovery of truth and when we're awarded with status for those discoveries. Mm. And is, do you talk about kind of the state in modernity? Do you think that we've changed in terms of how those things are valued? I'm thinking about the influence of things like social media and how that seems to have activated our tribalism and this sort of sense that um, everyone else is wrong. Yes. <laughs> if we get yeah. one online, that kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
yeah, I mean, so you're never going to get rid of uh, uh, of tribalism, and 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 the, the concept of the status game is is a kind of reframing of that idea of tribalism. You, you know, the basic idea being that we've that we're, you know, we're a tribal ape, uh, and that means that we have these two very powerful subconscious. Um, drives to be successfully connected into groups because that was a matter of survival, obviously, in the hunter-gatherer times. But then once you're in that group, you've got to earn status because the more status you earned in those groups, uh, the better um, supplies of food you got, the, the safer your sleeping sites, the greater your choice of mate. So it directly connects to your survival and reproduction. So it's a basic heuristic. Connect, be, be experience belonging with a group of people, a coalition of people. But once you're in that coalition, compete for status with them, and your coalition competes with other coalitions for status too. And so, 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 so that, that, that was the shape of human life 20,000 years ago and more. It's the shape of human life today. So, you, 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 and that doesn't change with modernity. You know, like a, a scientific, uh, the, the AstraZeneca is a success game. That's a coalition of people competing for status with each other internally and competing for status with Pfizer. And, that, and, and, and those are the things that, that, that help, help drive them. And, and, you know, with social media, I talk a lot about social media in selfie, but also in the status game. And, you know, my, my kind of take on social media really is that, 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 we're, that we're very good at blaming. We're always very good at blaming baddies because of our story to blame villains for the bad things that happen. You know, it was Hitler's fault in the Second World War and it was Mark Zuckerberg's fault and Jack Dorsey's fault uh, um, uh, about um, uh, social media. And of course, those things are partly true, but they're, they're, they're really reductionist. And actually, they, they give us so much wiggle room because I think, you know, what, what you see in, in social media is just human behavior. If you connect millions of people together, you're going to see status games being played. And those are dominance games, people threatening and coercing, virtue games, people showing off their virtue, following rules, enforcing rules, and success games, showing off their amazing holidays and their beautiful flat stomach and so on and so on. And that's always, that is social media, dominance, virtue, and success, and that competition. So it's just, that's our humanity for better and for worse. And in Science of Storytelling, you link that to neuroscience or what, what were your kind of what's your thesis around that how do you think it plays out what's the scientific basis for those kind of well games? I, 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 in all of the books i kind of uh, uh, attack it from three different angles there's the evolutionary psychology and the social psychology and the neuroscience um you know the evolutionary psychology obviously tells us about the groupishness um uh, but also the history of storytelling why do we tell stories in the in the first place um, uh, you know, a, 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 a big um, um, kind of idea that I always keep going back to is this idea that the language evolved in the first place to swap gossip, because gossip is what kept our groups um, cooperating. Um, and, you know, so gossip networks, just, you know, big religion is a gossip network, but you've got God as the referee rather than the tribal elders. Social, uh, you know, the, the media is a, is a gossip network. And today the internet is a, is a gossip network. Um, so uh, uh, the social psychology tells us loads about the storytelling brain, the biases, you know, confirmation bias, all the ways that the brain, um, all the tricks it has, the hacks it has to make us to keep us feeling heroic and superior and better um, uh, uh, on average than other people in, in various ways. You know, the most powerful bias, um, um, many think being the moral bias. We're very good at feeling that we're morally better than other people. Um, and then the, the neuro, I think the, the most interesting thing about the neuroscience is, 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 is this idea of, of, of confabulation, this idea that, um, you know, we talk about the storytelling brain, that's not like a, 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 a trendy TED talk like soundbite, that's real. And we have a narrator in our heads all the time talking to us and narrating our days. And I, I, I think the, 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 the the, the thing for me that, that, that kind of led me down this path about the storytelling it was reading about this idea of confabulation and that this voice we've got in our heads, its job is literally to tell the story of our lives, to take information from within our bodies and from around us and tie it to, and look at, and to watch our behavior and to tie that into a heroic story. And that that voice has no direct access to the real reasons why we do what we do and why we think what we, what we think. It's all a story. It might be true. It might not be true. It's, it's almost certainly not wholly true. So, 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 so that was what really led me down this path. I just thought that was mind blowing to use a bit of a cliche. This idea that this storyteller in our head is kind of bullshit. It's a bullshitter. It's kind of making up these stories. It doesn't know what the truth is. Hmm. It reminds me a little bit of um, the idea behind um, solitary confinement in, 
in jail, why we find that so torturous. And as I understand it, it's because when we're not telling our story on a regular basis to people and intertwining it and just hearing ourselves nar narrate our own story, we start to kind of almost like fall apart. Yeah. And it's known as sort of one of the most, um, yeah, one, one of, it's, it's known as a, almost like a form of torture, solitary confinement. Oh, yeah. Is it for that reason that we just need to hear ourselves narrating our lives? I, I think that's certainly true. You know, we, we, you know our, our self is created in the conversations we have with other people and in, the, in our social interactions. We, we you know, um, th th there's a phrase that I quote in Selfie, I think it's Coolidge, I am who, who I think other people think I am. So if you don't know what other, how other people think you are, I mean, certainly me, I'm, you know, I'm quite a solitary writer. I live in the country, I don't have any kids, I don't socialise much. So I, you know, I, I definitely have periods of weirdness because I'm just not socialising enough and I get lost in my head and get paranoid. Um, but there's something else going on, I think, with solitary confinement and, that, and that's about uh, 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 the effectance motive. And that, you know, part of being a storytelling animal is this drive we have to do things, to be the causes of effects in our environment, to create plots of our lives. Um, there was a, a really interesting study that I, I read about where they put people in flotation tanks and they covered their eyes um, and blocked their ears. And within seconds, they start doing this with their fingers in the water um, because, they, because people cannot not be the cause of effects in their environment. And in, in, in this study, so one of them started singing sea shanties at the top of his voice. You know, we find it absolutely torture to not be the cause of effects. And that, again, it's part of our storytelling nature. We have to make things happen. And your, your most recent book is The Status Game. How would you summarise that? Is it, is it a continuation of the, of the journey that you've been on so far? Yeah, I mean, it stands alone as a, as a book. And, and as I said, it, it's really about the subconscious reality of, you know, what's really going on underneath the story. And, and you know, of course, there are loads of drives. I, I'm not arguing at all that everything is status. Everything isn't status. But, but, uh, and the reason I call it the game is because it's belonging to. It's connecting into games and playing those games. So belonging... Uh, you know, connection and, and, and status. It's, uh, and, and it's really, I'm trying to kind of just ref show human life in a new way in, in, in say, look, you know, everywhere you look, it's just, it's just status games. You know, religion is a status game, a corporation is a status game, a football team, a cult, um, a political movement. It's just status games. So, so that, 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 that's the book. Mm. Is it fair to say just, or is it um, is there more of an aspect to it than that? It's, it sounds reductive. Yeah. The word just. Uh, yeah. Okay. So ju just is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so it's not. Of course, there's a lot more than just status games. So, so you know, one example would be, um, you know, I talk about status. Basically, it's our reward for being of value. It, you know, w w when our when our kind of human brains were evolving in the Pleistocene. Um, uh, kind of evolution had to find a way of incentivizing selfless behavior, uh, behavior that privileged the group over the individual. And you know, status is how we do that. Um, uh, and so w when we behave in a selfless way, universally, no matter where you go, selflessness is sort of heroic. Uh, you know, Joseph Campbell um, wrote, about, uh, wrote about the, you know, the essence of the hero being giving yourself up for the, for the many. Um, and, and, you know, likewise, selfishness is universally thought to be evil, nasty, villains are selfish. And, and, and so, 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 um, so yeah, that's that kind of moral um, status. And, 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 so, and, and so, and, you know, obviously, if we're successful, we're competent, that, that's also a value to the group. So, 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 you know, status is that feeling of being of value. That's all it is. And, and so an example would be the women who invented the AstraZeneca vaccine. Like, we know we're currently celebrating them as heroes, and that's great. That's what we do well as humans. We are rewarding them with, you're amazing. Um, but I'm not arguing that's their only motive. Status is a big motive for everyone. But they're also, they're nerds. They love science. They're fascinated by all this stuff. So, so, so the rewards are also... Um, as well as you know, it's belonging and connection, but there's also the satisfaction of this deep gnawing curiosity they have. So, so yeah, it's not life isn't just status games, but status games are the kind of structure I think of of, of human life and, um, outside the family, social life, human social life, and of human striving. Mm. And there sounds like I'm getting a lot of echoes of Jordan Peterson's work. He talks about like the lobsters, the dominance hierarchies, yeah. and also about um, storytelling, like the deep mythos, the archetypes. Is there overlaps? Are there overlaps with your thought and his? Yeah, definitely. So, 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 I mean, Jordan Peterson and I have been on kind of parallel paths. Obviously, one of us has been slightly more successful than the, <laughs> than the other. Um, and I actually got in touch with um, Jordan Peterson after Selfie came out, which is before 
um, uh, his uh, 12 rules came out. Because um, I said, look, you know, we're, we're um, you know, we're, we're, I've been thinking about this stuff too, um, um, uh, and we nearly, we, we nearly met. But but he, but in between that and we were, when we were going to meet, he became a global megastar. So it, it just didn't happen. But but yes, yeah, so, so, so we have very parallel paths. And I, and I came across him when I was researching the storytelling book because I started googling science of storytelling a lot, and his lectures came up. So it was before all the woke, you know, or the or the or, 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 or the or, or the the, C, the C16 stuff. Um, but but there are yeah so there, but so as you'd imagine there are lots of similarities but there are lots of differences too. Um, so in, in selfie, I, you know, I talk about the beginnings of the Western self, and, and Jordan Peterson obviously talks a lot about Christianity. But in selfie, I I, I, I begin it in ancient Greece, you, you know. So, so that's that, that's a big difference. And also when it comes to the, sort of the lobster stuff, the dominance hierarchies. Um, he, he, I, in, in the status game, as I said, I talk about those three different ways of earning status. Yes, there's dominance, and, and researchers talk about dominance, but when researchers talk about dominance, they specifically mean violence, the threat of it, you know, ostr the threat of ostracization, bullying, all, all you know, male and female typical aggression. Um, but then there's these prestige forms, there's, there's virtue and there's success as well. So I'm kind of, I, I think it's a slightly more expansive vision of, of what, what, hi what human hierarchies are. Mm. When you say you start in ancient Greece rather than Christianity, can you explain more about that? Yeah, so, so, so uh, you know, um, when, when I'm writing in Selfie about, uh, about you know, the, 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 story, the story that the West tells about the self, and when I sort of looked into that, I, I came across this amazing body of research. Richard Nisbet is, is the main kind of guy in there. That he talks about the geography of thought. And they very much place that not with Christianity, but with, in ancient Greece. And of course, Christianity is incredibly important. But that comes out of, you know, a lot of that thought comes out of ancient Greece, which predates Christianity. And so they have this amazing body of work, um, w w w which argues, I think, compellingly, that um, individualism comes out of the physical landscape of ancient Greece. So, so, so the argument is that ancient Greece was this weird, it wasn't like, a, like one big landmass. It, it, it's, it, it was a thousand, around a thousand city-states um, dotted around in islands and coastal communities. Um, so very, you know, pointillist um, uh, uh, and ecologically it was little rocky outcrops and, um, you know, cliffs descending to sea. So very little land for farming. So to get along and get ahead in ancient Greece, to, um, you, you had to be a self-starter. You had to get up and get out of bed and do it yourself or in a very small group of people. You were um, making olive oil or tanning hides or, you know, so, so, so it's this group of um, people that, 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 that had to rely on themselves to, to get ahead. And out of that becomes an ideal of self which is individualist, which is about the power of the individual. And so when you think about ancient Greek culture, you've got uh, you know, um, beautiful statues of idealized male and female forms. Um, you know, when you look at ancient Greek statues of male torsos, they don't look, they would look completely correct on the front of men's health if they were human. They are exactly what we, what we like, even down to that kind of crevice they've got around the hips, which is apparently unnatural and very hard to get. That, uh, you know, in perfect female forms, you've got the story of Narcissus, somebody that became so self-obsessed, you know, um, uh, he, he, he kind of fell in love with his own uh, image. You've got um, um, uh, 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 education being an ideal. You've got ideas about self-esteem, that, that, that a noble man has self-esteem, uh, and you know, the idea of, and you have democracy, of course. Um, and at the same time, um, so around two and a half thousand years ago, over in East Asia, Nisbet and, and, and colleagues compare it to what was going on in, in China, what is now China. That was Confucianist, so a completely opposite landscape to ancient Greece. Landlocked, undulating mountains. Uh, in, in, in China, you were either um, part of a, generally part of a large wheat growing community or a large rice growing community, or they had these huge irrigation projects, but very communitarian um, projects. So to get along and get ahead, you had to be subservient to the group. And that creates a completely opposite ideal of self. And what was really interesting is, is how those cultures, those cultural ideals, still inform us today. And there's an amazing set of work which, which, which looks at, um, they, they put spectacles on people and they, and they, um, they monitor the, their saccades, the, the way that uh, the micro-movements their pupils are making to scan their environment. Um, 
Uh, and one of the experiments they do, they take um, Western students and Chinese or East Asian students and they, they, they get them to watch an animation of a, of a fish in a fish tank. And there's a big kind of flashy colourful fish at the front, and various fish in the background and stuff. And the first thing they find is that the Westerners just tend to focus on that individual fish. They're just interested in that fish, mostly. And the East Asians are darting around everywhere, looking at the fishing context. Um, uh, uh, and then when you get them out of the lab, you say to the Westerners, what did you think of the fish? And they say, well, I love that fish. That fish was the star. That was the main fish, the, you know, the, the daddy fish. But the East Asian people go, oh, I felt so bad for that fish. It had been kicked out of the group and it was lonely. And um, so, so, so that to me tells us two really extraordinary things. The first thing is that, is, is that, that the, the, the nature of the landscape two and a half thousand years ago is literally affecting how we understand reality and experience reality uh, uh, today. Um, but also how that experience of reality cre from that comes these completely differing value systems, moral value systems. You know, one in which the individual is, yeah, the, you know, the standout, the hero. And another one is w w in which the person standing out is seen as something bad and negative. I mean, and there's loads of work that, that looks at this, you know, leadership in China, it, 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 shy people are seen as, um, are seen as potential leaders in China, which is complete opposite to here that we value confidence and, and pushing forward. It's interesting you say that, that we value confidence, we value pushing forward, and you also mentioned woke before. Mm. And there's a weird paradox now that victimhood is increasingly, in some circles, in some groups, victimhood is now a sort of, um, has become a status game. And so yeah. how, how do you make sense of that? Because it does seem kind of paradoxical, but there is a sort of sense that victimhood has become a certain status that people want to acquire. Yes, certainly. So I mean, there's a chapter in the status game called Victims, Warriors, Witches, where I deal with these kind of different archetypes that we're seeing now, um, and that, in the sense we, we've always seen. And, and, and victimhood is a really interesting one. Um, um, I mean, the way I describe it in the book is that, you know, we're all these storytellers and um, I, I talk about various examples of kind of fake victimhood. So there was a there, there was a professor that did a talk at, at American University about um, um, uh, about, about how you know, racism was everywhere. And then she came out and shock horror found a car had been vandalized with swastikas and stuff. And the police discovered that she'd done it, you know. So, so uh, um, and, and, and the Jesse Smollett case. Um, and, but there are also, in the book, I talk about right-wing equivalents of this. I'm not quite so spectacular, but, but it happens. There was somebody that I, th I think they, they pretended they'd got beef for a, a, a Barack Obama cut on their head or something and, and, and it was and it was they'd done it themselves uh, and I th and I think partly what's going on here is that people are um, they're reaffirming the kind of story that their tribe tells about the world um, you know they, they, they're saying look we're right you know these this this status game over here are not deserving of status they're terrible awful scum um, so, 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 so uh, you know and we, we applaud people for doing that you know we love we love it when um, when uh, people come along and, and tell us that the story that we tell about the world, this heroic story, this moral story with heroes and villains and action is true. It's not in your head, it's true. And I, and I think that's a really important function that victims play. And, you know, in their victimhood, we all become heroic. We gather around them and we go, no, we're going to fight back. And often these stories of victimhood are, are really stories of bravery. I survived this. You know, I went through this and I'm back and I'm going to fight back. So, th so there's always that heroic element in them too. Mm. And is this a new phenomenon where like hierarchy is based on victimhood rather than based on success or hero heroism? Um, or do you think that there's kind of an aspect of heroism within even the sort of victim? I, I think there's an aspect of heroism even within the victim. I mean, if you think about an archetypal story, um, you know, heroes begin as, often begin as victims. They're orphans, they're low status. And then through the, you know, and they're confronted with terrible obstacles, evil villains, and then they overcome them and become heroic. And I, and I think what you're seeing in victims is people in there living this archetypal heroic story. You know, and heroes become heroes only in the final act of an archetypal story. They're not, you know, they, 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 they can behave in heroic ways, but they're not heroes all the, all the, all the way through those stories. Um, so, 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 yeah, I, 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 I think I, I definitely think that's what's going on. Um, I, I, in, in, in the in, in the mode of you know the thesis of the science of storytelling, you know, dominance games, virtue games, and success games, in that kind of language, 
uh, you know, I, I think what happened post-industrial revolution is that we became much more success focused. And I think post neoliberal revolution, Thatcher and Reagan in the 80s and 90s, we become even more success focused. Um, uh, but, but I think what's happened in selfie, I write about what happens when groups go through trauma and bad things happen. So after the First World War, after the Depression, we became much more connected and communitarian in the West. Uh, and I think that's what's happened. I, I think um, um, that's what's happened since the global financial crisis, you know, beginning with the Occupy movement. I think um, and, um, you know, life for millennials, life for Gen Zs, famously, it's, it, it's not as easy as it has been for boomers and Gen Xs. So I, I think that's part, it's not the whole story, but I think that's part of the story. I think, I think that um, what we've seen since the global financial crisis is a retreat from that success culture back into a virtue culture where, where we award status for people behaving in moralistic ways. And of course, you know, I don't need to tell you, you know, moralistic is, is, is not all a good thing. It's definitely got a significant dark half. Mm. Uh, is it your sense or belief that many of our, but is it your belief? Is it, is it your perspective that many of our beliefs are effectively status driven? Yes, uh, it, it is. It, uh, and, and I think when you look at the research, uh, you know, it, it's pretty unequivocal that, that we don't, that we believe what our elites uh, believes to be true, generally speaking. So, it, so in the, in the language of the status game, we, in our status game, we look up who are the people who are doing really well in this game. Who are the people that I want to be like? Okay, and you know, in the book, I talk about the copy flat to conform um, uh, mechanism. And in this I think it's of, good to say that we don't mean elites, as in just the sort of what you might call the kind of mainstream. Elites. Oh right, yeah. There's elites on all sides. Yes, it's like the contrarian elite as much Definitely. as the kind of mainstream elite yeah. and the. So, yeah. Yeah. So, 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 you know, in, in all our coalitions, in all our status games, there will be people that you could call elites. They're not necessarily millionaires or celebrities. They're just the people at the top of that game. And every group will have its elites. And those are the people that we look up to and we mimic. You know, humans are amazing copying animals. Um, when we see people who, who are successfully earning status in the game that we're playing, we, you know, we, we, can, we, can, we can become complete. Um, you know, um, Zombies is putting it too far, but you know, we can dress like them, copy their aesthetic tastes, talk like them. Um, you know, there's a whole raft of podcasters that talk a bit like Sam Harris, you know, you know, you know the, the thing. It's, not, it's human nature. Um, uh, and, and, and y y you know, we haven't got time to check for ourselves what's true. So what we do is we, we copy our elites. We copy the beliefs of our elites, uh, generally speaking. Mm. Yeah, it's what we sometimes call outsourcing our, outsourcing our sense making. Mm. Like there, the cognitive complexity of the world is too much, so we're all doing that, whether we admit it or not. We are doing that, and we we don't really have any choice because things are too complex. Yeah, the, the first chapter of the Heretics, I was with a creationist, a proper hardcore creationist in the northern states of Australia, which is like the southern states of America in the fifties. It's really, it's like that, you know. And and one of the things he said to me, which really caught me off guard, was just he said, you know, this is just my value system versus your value system, and and he caught me out because because I was there kind of as a journalist, um, mocking him for his anti-evolutionary beliefs. And when I really, and, and this is all in the chapter, it was in the piece, when I actually met an expert in evolution, I realized I didn't know anything about evolution. I still thought that chimpanzees turn, or apes turned into humans. You know, I, I, even basic stuff I didn't get, didn't get right. So I was there all smug going, look at this, uh, you know, anti, you know, the, 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 this person who's against evolution, this anti-Darwinian. And I didn't know anything about evolution or Darwin. I just assumed it was true because my elites said it was true. So he was absolutely right about that. And he was also absolutely right that he knew much more about Darwin than I did. Mm. Yeah, the, the picture that you were sketching out before reminds me a lot of what Venkatesh Rao talked about in the Internet of Beef. So you're familiar with that piece? Oh, no. So he basically said that he talked about Twitter a lot and talked about that Twitter and many social media spaces are now beef only spaces. <laughs> um, people buy, buy cele what he called celebrity nights and mooks. So the knights are sort of the celebrities on Twitter, increasingly who you either agree, agree with them or they go to war. So yeah. people who won't accept criticism okay. and because that's the way that you attract, that's the way you attract followers. Yeah, and yeah. What was fascinating reading that, and I'd highly recommend anyone watching to read that article, is he kind of sketched out, it, it was a kind of regression to feudalism. You've got these celebrity knights, they're, they're armies of mooks that were basically engaged in combat along lines broadly defined by the celebrity knights, like they were the sort of tribal lords, their mooks would sort of follow them, and then you have sort of 
the more success you have, the more followers you have who are willing to go to war on your behalf. And what was really fascinating was it's an honor-based society where any kind of contradiction is seen as disrespect and then your MOOCs will go to war on your behalf. And this was sort of becoming the way that all of these social media spaces are sort of dominant. I think it was a beautiful yeah, description. That's, that's very close to the status game. In the yeah. status game, I talk about warriors because I compare them to warriors in hunter-gatherer groups. And when you know, uh, that when when study when studies are made, they find that the, the, the uh, a key motivator for warriors and hunter-gatherer groups is the state are the status rewards. Um, uh, um, but the the model that I use about uh, uh, about you know when we go to war. Um, I, 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 it, it was from as a psychologist called Michelle Gelfland, who, who's, a, who's got some fascinating work, a brilliant book, which I don't think many people are aware of, called Rule Makers, Rule Breakers. And she talks about, um, she, she analyzes actually cultures uh, in terms of their tightness and their looseness. So it's a really simple concept. A loose culture, the UK is a loose culture. Um, Germany is a relatively tight culture. The northern states of, of the US are relatively loose, southern states relatively tight. And, and what, what she finds with tight cultures is they've got a history of trauma, famine, bad things have happened. So they've, they, they, they've tightened up their connections um, so that they're much more about morality, they're much more about conformity. Um, it, things like the, the, the clocks in public spaces in, in tight cultures are more in sync than in loose cultures. The trains run on time more. Um, but also, they're much more suspicious of outsiders. Um, uh, they're, 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 they're more prone to dominance behavior. They're more superstitious. They're more prone to superstitious belief. And um, so I kind of expand on that idea in the status game to, to talk about that groups in general, because you can see tightness and looseness in groups. And you can see that also in the same way that when a group comes un feels like it's under attack, it becomes tighter. And you certainly see that on social media. I in my chapter on, on this, I talk about Jamil Jamila Jamil, and Lawrence Fox, two British you know, actress and an actor um, who, 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 as I argue in the book, have become more famous for their warring on, online than they, than they ever were for their acting. Um, and, and you can see um, these status games that are played out with them in charge. They're very tight groups. They're very conformist. They're very chippy about um, attacks to, uh, on their kind of sacred rules. Um, some of the research is just really interesting about the status dynamics of these groups. Uh, you know, the people like the Jamils and the Foxes of this world are very, are, 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 you know, the warriors tend to be much more interested in status than the average person. And the, the, the people that go out and cause trouble on social media are, are very often obsessed with status, but low status. And these are the ones that you see kind of going to war on their behalf. And I, I wonder if we could sort of apply this lens to some of the topics that are kind of really ripping people apart at the moment kind of the the vax anti-vax yeah. or ivermectin that we featured on the on the channel quite a bit um i mean what i'm struck by is how few people change their position even when like ivermectin in particular i think the the level of the level of fraud that's been undercover un, uncovered the fact that at the beginning there was this narrative of oh the only reason that anyone could have for not um seeing the value of this medicine, it's a miracle drug, it could end the pandemic tomorrow, is because of this massive conspiracy. And I think that narrative has been completely, whether or not ivermectin is proved to have an effect, I think that narrative has now been pretty much shown to be untrue. I mean, it's yeah. th there's, there's a lot more uh, uncertainty about the, the level of evidence, et cetera, et cetera. But very few people have actually changed their position publicly. Yeah, I, and I think that's, that, that, that's right. I mean, in the book, I've got a chapter where I actually interview an, a former anti-vaxxer uh, and uh, and she she was fascinating. Um, Miranda Dinder, her name was, and when she was eighteen, she wanted a home birth, so she just found a midwife. And the midwife came around and she said, "Have you ever thought about not vaccinating your kid?" And she said, "I didn't know what she was talking about. I thought that sounds mad. Why would you not vaccinate?" And she said, "Just look, look on Google. You'll find all the information." So she typed into Google, "Why not vaccinate?" And of course, it all came up. You know, it all came up. And she joined a Facebook um, group um, called Great Mothers Questioning Vaccines, they were called. And she, you know, she, she, she said, look, I love strong, independent women. I grew up in a family of women. I love, you know, bolshy women. And here they were, and I was 18. They were all, you know, mums of so many children. And they were telling me all these horror stories about vaccines. And, you know, and I completely believed them. 
And she said, but she said, once you're in there, you know, it's, it, it's the classic thing. Connection isn't enough for humans. We're not happy to be just connect, you know, likable but useless. We want to feel a value. We want to rise up that status hierarchy. And in the book, I talk about this concept of active belief, you know, and, and, I, and I think you see this and, and the rewards for Miranda were very much active belief, this idea that we take her, this sacred belief of the group, the, the belief that the group coalesces around and becomes symbolic for the group in general. And we go out into the world and we become possessed by it. Uh, you know, we proselytize for it, we argue for it, we're on the forums, we're on Twitter. And she said, you know, what would happen is that she'd go and have an argument with the doctor, an argument with her cousins and come back straight on the computer. You should have seen me, I was spitting fire. And they go, yeah, you go girl. And you move up, you move up the hierarchy. The more you allow that belief to possess you, the more you move up that hierarchy. And this is really dangerous because, you know, as I say in the book, status is a human need. You know, we're, we're very good at looking down our noses at it, but we need status. Without it, we, we become depressed, potentially suicidal, our physical health suffers. And since the dawn of the internet, pe pe people are finding that their main source of status, this incredibly valuable resource, is on Facebook. It's on their phone. So, so, you know, they're just a normal person in real life, but she, she began to see herself as this warrior out there trying to save the world from evil pharma. And you certainly see this in, you know, in the Ivermectin, Ivermectin group, but also in the, in, in the very, very, very pro-vax group. You know, the, the people that are out there being warriors, um, expressing active belief, being very, very emotional about this belief, staking their status on its being tr uh, true, I think are in a, in a really dangerous place. Because, they, because their brains are, are incredibly incentivized to protect their, their status. And that means protecting the story that they're telling about the world. Mm. Yeah, and you mentioned there's, there's the same thing on the other side, like the yeah. kind of vaccine maximalists as well. Yeah. And you can see that kind of game being played on, on both sides of the, of, the, of the case. Is there always an outgroup with status games then? Um, because part of, the, part of the drive of them is like demonizing others and no. sort of... Yeah, I, I, I assumed that there, that, 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 there, that there would be, but that, that there isn't. Or there doesn't have to be an outgroup. You know, outgroup. You know, when when a game attacks game, that, that that's a huge motivator for kind of status play. Because when our game wins status, we win status too. Um, but but I mean, so, so one of the examples. So in the book, I talk about. A, a, an unhealthy status game, so the, the, like a company like Enron. So Enron, um, in a company like Enron, status is jealously guarded. You know, we, how prestige, the prestige forms of status work. Dominance, we force people to attend to us in status. When it's prestige, people offer it to us freely. They, they, you know, and I think in unhealthy groups, um, um, people jealously guard their status because there's not much going around. And Enron famously had these, the way they called it, a, a rank and yank system. So the top, every, so the, the people would be put into a rank of performance and the top 15% would be promoted, the bottom 15% would be just fired and the middle, percent, middle chunk would be just terrified. And so it's a really unhealthy environment and of course it ended up being one of the most corrupt companies. Um, uh, in the world, in, in, in the history of, of the world. Um, but the, the opposite of that would be CrossFit. You know, I did, a, I did a story as a journalist on CrossFit. I went to the CrossFit Games in LA. And CrossFit is addictive, famously addictive, because it's all about status. It's all about the group. It's purely positive. Come on, you can do it. You're amazing. You're fantastic. You know, very American thing. But the reason that CrossFit becomes like a cult is because people become drunk on the status rewards. And there's no, they, they, you know, there's no outgroup in CrossFit. I don't think they have CrossFit versus CrossFit or, or a group. Or if they do, you know, box versus box. If they do, that isn't the main driver of that behaviour. So, so we, we don't we don't have to have an outgroup. But but certainly when there is a when there is a rival game, that does massively ramp up our the tightness of the group and our capacity to um, go down these weird paths of sense making. Mm. And you mentioned prestige and status. Do you see those as being different? No, pre so prestige is a form of status. So, 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 so you know, what's we, contrasted to prestige then? Dominance. So, 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 so for millions of years we've been playing dominance games. You know, Jordan Peterson talks about the lobster. There's also the hens that peck each other until there's a pecking order established. Um, uh, um, so, so that's, that's our animalistic self. It's still obviously still in us. Um, but when we, w w when we began to uh, live communally um, uh, and we went through that process of, they call it self-domestication, um, retreating from those, that, those kind of dominance behaviors, um, you know, our skeletons change, our muscular change, our brain chemistry change. We, beca we became much more social animals. 
And if, if you're living in that communal way, um, competing for status of violence is just really bad because everyone's just beating each other up all the time and threatening each other all the time. So, so you know, we develop language and, you know, part of that, and, you know, f to gossip and part of that gossip is, is you have a reputation now with which to play status games and that reputation can go up and it can go down. If you're valuable to the group, you go up, you earn prestige. And if you're not, your, your, your reputation goes down and the, 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 the punishments are dreadful from everything from mockery, humiliation, ostracization to execution, which is thought to be a, you know, at once a, a human universal. So that's prestige. Uh, and as I said before, prestige divides into two separate areas, this virtue and their success. They're both forms of, they're both two routes to prestige. Mm. Yeah, I'm just thinking about, I mean, there's, there's obviously these drivers towards tribalism, mm. um, which is one of the factors that we've talked about a lot. I'm really focused on at the moment is like, how can we mediate between these sort of different tribes? But in a way, what you need is a new strange attractor that values that. Like you need a, an environment where nuance is valued. Yes. You need an environment where mediation is valued where people who are willing to sort of talk across uh, what you might call kind of tribal lines, that becomes a value in itself. And I don't see that there is one of those at the moment because the tribal things are, are, so, are so powerful and they're fueled by social media and that sort of extra tribalizing factor. But I guess I'm just sort of thinking aloud of, we need to create some kind of strange attractor, a, commu a new community where those are the values, where those yeah. are the things that people that you, you're actually getting status through nuance, through yes. being willing to talk to people on the other side, through trying to synthesize different perspectives, that kind of thing. Definitely. And it's an interesting yeah. way. Of, how would you reflect on that? Yeah, it, it would be you, you, just need to, you need to design a, a status game in which the status is rewarded for, as you say, talking across lines, um, being able to hold two conflicting stories in your head at the same time and sort of busting through that seductive, incredibly seductive, morally drenched story about the world that we that our brains want to tell and and do the effort of um of seeing the other person's story i mean you've been a journalist for years i, I was a journalist for years and you know that that that's the one thing that i took away from doing long-form journalism for 20 years that is the story that you go into that 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 piece um, of research with is never true you, you know you can go in thinking these people are devils they're awful people when you sit down with them and you talk to them open-heartedly with a sincere uh, attempt at getting to the truth and you'll find a you'll find a, 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 a you, you, you'll find that you, the story that you're telling of the world is reductive and simplistic and generally flatters your own story about the world so i i think journalism at its best and, and it it happens rarely these days post-internet because the incentives have changed but in the glory days of journalism especially long-form journalism there were status rewards for 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 with a generous heart, seeing both sides of the story and reporting that back to people. Mm. Yeah, it's a very simple reframing, but it's not one that I that I come to myself about that. That is ultimately what we need to do if we're going to if we're going to kind of change the culture in that way. We need to create an ecosystem or some kind of strange attractor that values those values those more than the tribalism game that's being played elsewhere. Mm. Yeah, I mean, w w one of the first pieces of journalism that I read when I was a teenager that, that really stuck with me was in. There's a magazine called Loaded, which is a big magazine over here, and there was a writer called Ben Marshall, and he, and he wrote a piece about, um, it was just after Tony Blair had outlawed fox hunting, or maybe it was just before. But anyway, there were hunters and there were anti-hunt people. And he wrote this story, and he used the phrase, and it was the first time I'd heard it, the, a curse on both your houses. It was like, they're all ourselves. And, and it was the first time I'd seen that, 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 you know, he wasn't picking a side. He was just saying, these people are all, you know, nuts. And, and, I, and I, I, I didn't know that you could tell stories like that. And, and I remember being so impressed by, by that story. And, 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 I've, and I've always, you know, I've always kind of carried that with me through my, you know, journalistic career. In The Heretics, there was a whole chapter where, where I, you know, I literally went on holiday with a bunch of genuine, actual Nazis, not like Twitter Nazis, real Nazis with SS tattoos. Um, and which was a holiday that was led by David Irving, the former, hol formerly Holocaust denying historian is no longer Holocaust denying. Um, and, you know, I came back with a, with, 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 with a, you know, went in there thinking, oh, my God, these are actual Nazis. They're pure evil. Um, but in that in that chapter, I, you know, I, what, what happened was I, I interviewed David Irving 
Um, and I kind of showed my hand a bit too much at the beginning of the trip and it was, became obvious that I was hostile. So he kind of started shutting me down. I was panicking, thinking, God, I spent like, I don't know, it was thousands of pounds to be there. I haven't got my material yet. And I was confiding in the Nazis. Um, and, and, and I'd sort of been as honest with them as I could. I said, I'm writing a book about heretics and he's like such a big heretic. And um, at the end of every, at the end of every um, day, there'll be like a, a question and answer session with David Irving. And I found out halfway through the trip that they conspired between them to ask him questions about his childhood and stuff that would be valuable to me for my book project. And I was like, fuck, that's so nice. And you find you catch yourself going, oh, God, that's such a good bunch of guys. And then you remember the, the tattoo on the neck. And, 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 you know, what do you do with that? And, and, and the, 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 what I wrote about in that chapter was this extraordinary realisation I had from talking to them that a lot of them had had parents that had served with the Nazis in the Second World War. And one of them, they were German, or they were German, yeah, yeah. yeah. Or there was an Aust Australian guy whose parents were German, you know. And, and I, th I think it was the Australian guy. But there was one of these, one of the guys there. At the end of the um, holiday, there was this showing of the film Downfall, which is, I, I'm sure you know, is, is, is a sort of hyper realistic film about the last days in Hitler's bunker. And this guy didn't want to watch the film because his dad was in the bunker with Hitler and he found it too upsetting, too traumatic to watch. It was it's too much for him. And it, it suddenly occurred to me that a lot of these guys, they, they love their mum and they love their dad. And their mums and dads were Nazis, in some cases quite senior Nazis. And so they've been brought up with this story about the world in which their Nazi is a synonym for evil and their brains have rejected it. They can't allow themselves to believe that that's true. So they get involved with Holocaust denial and they get involved with what, how it's all exaggerated. There wasn't really six million. They weren't really gassing them. And, you know, they, they go down that road. And, and, and it's just it's their storytelling brains kind of defending them. And, you know, that, that's a, you could say that's a sympathetic story towards the towards the Nazis. And it is, you know, it is a sympathetic story towards the Nazis. And, and you know, I make no apology for that. You know, I want to understand people like Nazis. There's a chapter about homicidal incels in the, in the status game where I, you know, I try to understand um, Elliot Rogers, um, so, you know, there's, there's, uh, who, was, who was a spree killer who, who, who did a mass killing in 2014. Um, so, so yeah, and, and, you know, sometimes these stories are very controversial. That Nazi story, if it was published today, would be extremely controversial. But that, that, that I think, is the, is the good work that journalists can do, is to, is to go in there kind of open-heartedly and just sincerely i'm not trying to trip you up i'm not trying to win a prize by making you seem evil i really want to understand your story about of the world and, and how it motivates you hmm. and as you say a lot of the problem is that the incentive structures now don't reward that no um, how would you summarize that well i've lived through it you, you know i i became a journalist in 2000 in january 2000 and i've lived through i've lived through the effect the internet has had on journalism and it's been cat catastrophic catastrophic the incentives have changed from I'm going to I'm going to find out something fascinating about the world and the world of people and tell you about it to moral outrage to clicks. Y you know, clicks didn't exist pretty much in, in the year 2000. So the, I, I think the one of the what, one of the disastrous things that happened was that in, in the year 2000, when it was a long time before people had worked out that those tech people were not were not good people, you know, they, they, they were seen as the future. And people like Alan Rusbridger at The Guardian just completely believed their siren song, which is very powerful at the time, which is information wants to be free. So we give our news away for free. And what that means is that journalists stop getting paid properly, that, 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 um, that, that we're not getting um, uh, money from advertising, it's anywhere near so much, and we're not getting money, just people aren't buying the newspapers anymore. So money comes from clicks now. And how do we get clicks? Well, we, we know unequivocally how we get clicks. It's anger, emotion, moral outrage. The incentive is no longer about telling the whole story, uh, which is, you know, I've done lots of writings for The Guardian. The Guardian used to pride itself on that idea of telling the whole story. It doesn't do that anymore. It's become, as far as I'm concerned, the Daily Mail of the, of, of, of the left-wing Daily Mail at, at its worst. I know it's, that's probably slightly hyperbolic. Um, uh, so, so I think it's been catastrophic and I, and I think the context is, I think the reason that people don't understand how catastrophic it is, is when you look at the evolution of psychology, how essential gossip is to us. Gossip once kept our tribes together. Gossip, moral outrage, punishment, rewards for selflessness. Um, when, our when our communities became too big, 
we invented moralistic religions and God took over, you know, God was party to all the gossip and you'd get your punishment and rewards some, you know, in some religions in life, in other religions after death. Um, uh, after God died, in, uh, we, the media took over. The media became our gossip network. Uh, and, and, you know, so, so, so the media is obsessed with high status people doing, doing bad things and, and, you know, fermenting moral outrage. Um, and now that's collapsed. And now the Internet is our gossip network. And I think the Internet is a terrible gossip network. It's, it's, a, it's a disaster. And I think you only understand how disastrous it is when, when you understand that, that it is our gossip network and that gossip networks are essential to human society and human function. They always have been. Mm. Because it's so easily manipulated or because it just accelerates that drive towards moralistic outrage and just click the sort of what Tristan Harris talks about, the kind of battle to the, the bottom of the brainstem and... But yeah, but because, because, there are no, because the incentives are wrong and because there are no checks and balances. So, you know, so, 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 you know we're storytelling animals. We tell, you know, the, the, one of the dominant theories at the moment is, is that we develop language in the first place to swap gossip. That's how fundamental it is. So if that's true, it means that the first... The, the first stories were gossip stories and how gossip works is, you know, by, by use of moral outrage. We, 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 we hear a story about somebody behaving selfishly, often a high status person behaving selfishly, um, and we experience moral outrage. And moral outrage is an incredibly powerful emotion. And, and, and it, it, we've evolved to experience moral outrage such that it motivates us to act and we punish the transgressor. And, and it works in the stories that we read. We, we want to keep reading to the end of the book because we, we have to have that moral outrage satisfied that Darth Vader's gonna, gonna get his comeuppance. Um, and in real life, we wanna see that person punished. So that, that's who we are, that's how we think. But with journalism, there, you know, of, of course it wasn't perfect. Of course there were left-wing papers and right-wing papers. Of course there was SNBC and Fox and The Telegraph and The Guardian. Um, but there was still status to be earned in telling the full story. There was still status to be earned in, in, in accuracy, in facts, in we've got to give both sides their due here. And that's gone, that, that has largely gone away now uh, because the incentives have changed. Having moved into... Um, moved online, I guess we're trying to see whether there is a kind of strange attractor for, for nuance and for telling more of the story. But I can see we had Jordan Peterson, we, we like, I knew, I know that if we continue to put out like anti-woke content, for example, there's a huge audience there, especially on YouTube, um, and kind of feeling that sense of being pulled in various directions by the audience and by the incentive structures online, I think it's very dangerous. And it's very dangerous because I think the world starts warping itself around you without you even realising it. Completely, um, yeah. And I'd like to, I've heard you talk before about um, people who get kind of stuck in, I mean, it's in my language, but stuck in their story. Yeah. And there was woke and then there was anti-woke. And, and I think a huge section of kind of online media especially got, just got stuck in that anti-woke mm -hmm. um, story. And, and, you know, it's pleasurable if you're being frustrated and your sense of status is being challenged by this group over here. It's just... It's, great to connect with people and talk about it like obsessively but but there, there is an intellectual dead end as well and, and, and i think and i think it, as you said it's, it's really dangerous because when you pin your status on a on a set of beliefs um, I, I, for the heretics i was lucky enough to interview jonathan Haidt, and one of the things that stuck with me that he said was that i completely believe in man-made climate change but i don't believe climate scientists to tell me the truth about about that because it's become a sacred fact for them and they, and they can't think straight about them and it's the same way that I believe in the power of the markets but I don't trust libertarians to tell me the truth about free the power of the free market because it's become this sacred belief f for them and that, that's really stuck with me I, I think that's absolutely that's absolutely right and I think for me the tell is emotionality when you're seeing somebody that becomes highly emotional about this sacred belief they have you, you can't trust them not because they're dishonest people but because their brains are telling this um, super convenient story about the world and they, 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 their brains aren't in a place where they can rationally assess different voices. Yeah, and it's also to say that there is a lot of truth in the anti-woke perspective. Like there is a lot of um, truth in that we've become sort of, there's a very simplistic kind of narrative that needed to be challenged. And I think the it, it was challenged in sort of up through 2016, 2017, 2018, and there was a kind of antithesis position. Mm. But as far as I can tell now, that antithesis position has been well expressed. There's whole ecosystems built around that that I think are almost, if not as powerful as the ecosystems built around the sort of what people consider the legacy position. We see that now, especially with the, 
the vaccine debate. Like a huge number of people are not choosing the vaccine. There's a lot of, um, there's increasingly sort of, th there are two narratives. And I think it's very important now to kind of apply equal um, skepticism to both of them because both of them are not the whole story. Completely. The whole story yeah. has, has got to be a sort of synthesis beyond the uh, thesis antithesis position. Mm. And I think that synthesis is still nascent at the moment, but it certainly feels like we're in a very different place than we were in 2018 when I put out Glitch in the Matrix, was really interested in the Jordan Peterson and uh, still the, the mainstream narrative the weird thing is as well, you can also build your own reality. Like if you're only looking at the, the crimes on the kind of the woke side, you can build up a narrative that everything is getting worse, everything is, is the entire world is going woke and you need to kind of pick up arms against yeah. it. But if you then look from the other side, you can actually say, well, no, things are starting to change. The conversation's starting to change. Things are starting to move. So it's kind of... You can pick your own narrative, yeah, which I mean, is a very really dangerous position to be. That, that was a really interesting phenomenon that I, that, I, that I picked up when I was doing my heretics research. And, and, and I've never sort of really heard it expressed very much. But, but I think part of the storytelling brain is that we, that we, that we maximise the danger of our enemy. And, and, it, and in, in the book, I talk specifically about, um, at the time, the new atheist stroke sceptic movement were obsessed with homeopathy. This idea that homeopathy was this grand evil. And of course, homeopathy isn't a grand evil. It's, uh, in the book, you know, I argue that placebo effect is real homeopathy is quite sophisticated placebo theatre. If people want homeopathy, let them have homeopathy. But, but, the, but the framing of homeopathy was it was this terrible, disastrous thing. It was a threat that the National Health Service has spent it wasting all this money on it. And there, and there was this real, I mean, I, talked, I wrote a lot about James Randi as this kind of um, extraordinarily dubious figure that the skeptics just couldn't get their heads around that James Randi was, was not an honest man. And, and actually, that, you know, to a certain extent, they'd all been played by him. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and he was very good at that, uh, 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 telling this great story that they were all warriors for the truth. And if, and, and if it wasn't for the skeptics that, you know, this medieval dark world would come up, would, 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 would you know, would, would announce itself and, and, and kind of take over. I mean, those obviously weren't his words, but that's the general sense. That was what he was very good at doing. And, uh, and yeah, I, I think it's absolutely true. That's definitely part of the storytelling brain is this, is this we catastrophize the enemy. And, and I certainly think, you know, I've been through, a, you know, the whole anti-woke thing. And, and yeah, sometimes you feel like the, wor the world is going to end. I think, you know, I, you know Jordan Peterson, is, during the C16 times, talked very compellingly about this is just the beginning. They're coming for you. They're coming for you. And there's, there's a certain truth to that. Um, but as a, you know, as I say, in heretic stories are never true. That's the thing about stories; they're never true. They've got a bit of truth in them, which is what makes them compelling. But they're never the whole truth. Yeah, I mean that reminds me a lot of. I did quite a lot about Islamic extremism. Did a panorama about this, about the um, Paris bombings, uh, Paris attacks, and it was fascinating because it's always felt like, well, of course, if you've got a choice between being like a shelf stacker in Wolverhampton or a kind of unemployed in Belgium, of course you choose a narrative where you could be on the front line of a kind of heroic fight for your culture. And it's like, if you reframe it like that, well, of course, we're always going to have this problem. Yeah. Whatever the idea is, if it gives someone that level of status and that level of meaning in their life, then until we've got, uh, especially when you kind of compare it to the lack of meaning that we've got kind of permeating through the kind of secular West at the moment, we're going to lose because we, we can't yeah. offer that level of level of meaning and that level of status, I guess. Yeah. I mean, that, that was a really interesting, interesting concept um, that, 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 that I think there's more to, a lot more to say about it, but, but, I, but I'd never thought about it before. And that is the, 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 um, the quality of status that we have these days. And so, so yeah, I write about um, terror, you know, terrorists and, and gangs in the book and, 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 and absolutely agree. It's, it's that you know, we are designed to, to find and seek out status games to play. And if you're in a low socioeconomic group, if you're an immigrant uh, with not a lot of options open to you because you're not educated, what's going to offer you the most status? And, and often it's a street gang, a like drug dealing gang, or it's a, it could be an Islamic terrorist group. And, 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 and as you say, if that's the best route to status, that's the state that, that that's what you're going to do and so you know what these people who are in gangs and joining isis and al-qaeda they're, they're just doing what brains are designed to do you know they're they're, they're they're looking for status games to play and 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 just you know and related to that you know i, I think you know th there's that kind of political point that actually 
when we become kind of middle class and educated, what happens is, is that our choice of status gain becomes huge. You know, we can choose qualifications. We've got options for, for careers and hobbies and, and all this stuff. But if you're low on the socioeconomic scale or in a, in a developing country, you might not have. There's not going to be this great choice of different status games to play. So, so you're always going to have this, you know, if, 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 the, if the highest status person in your community is, is a drug dealer, a certain amount of people are always going to be drawn to that role because it's the best route to high status. And uh, yeah, just just briefly, the, the other the other thing is just I, I I think there's a lot to be said that I that I haven't said um, um, in my book that I, that I haven't thought enough about about the quality of status these days. You know, I I, I think you, especially if you're in a low socioeconomic group. You know, in the book I talk briefly about the sort of Tescoization of villages and. I was doing a story for The Observer a few years ago and I went to an old mining town. And I, and I had a conversation that always stayed with me with a young person in this town called Amarmford. And he said, you know, when we had the mines, people were miners and that was, people were proud of, of their mining heritage and they would go down the mine. And, but, and we also had all these small businesses. Um, we had butchers and bakers and candlestick makers and people had their own, they ran their own businesses. And he said, but the mines have gone and then Tesco's moved in. And then when Tesco's moved in, all the local businesses shut down. And he said, now we're just getting caught. He's, he's got a poetic phrase, he's stuck for a life in, going up and down the aisles and that's our life. And I just thought, you know, that, that's a really interesting point about the quality of status that's, that's on offer these days. Because he, he said, you know, if you own your own butcher, that's something to be proud of. This is my butcher shop. But if you work at the butcher's counter at Tesco's, that is not something that can be that proud of for most people. So, 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 so we never think about the quality of status that's, that's on offer in the world. And I, and I think that's a big, that's a big deal. Mm. Yeah, it's a very interesting way of reframing. You could sort of imagine public policy being reframed around that. Like, it's not just about jobs, it's about the kind of the status of jobs or the meaning of the meaning that people take from their existence or take from their lives. Yeah, and and you know in the, the book I sort of also write about um, tax credits. You, you know, the, 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 this system we have certainly in the UK, where um, when global corporations aren't paying their cleaners enough money, they get handouts from the government to top up their wages. And you know, and I, and I say in the book, you know, when we do that, we're stealing from them something they've earned. They're hardworking people. Some of them have two or three jobs. They've earned the status to be paid properly. And solving the problem with giving them money just to top their wages, it helps them practically, but it deprives them of, as I say, of something they've earned. And, and, and I think a better system would be to just pay them their tax credits through their wage packet, because then there's dignity in that. Mm. And where do you think this, your inquiry goes next? Do you have another book in mind or what comes <laughs> um, I've just, been, yeah, I, I, I'm not quite sure yet. I, I, I've, I've kind of got my feelers out um, Generally, I, I'm, I'm interested at the moment in, in in our in emotions. Just the idea of you know the, the, there is two competing ideas about emotions. We, we one story says that, that our emotions are bad and we have to squash them, and another one another narrative, often the woke one, is that we have to express our emotions and emotions are amazing and it's the lived experience. And I'm quite interested in what what's the actual truth of that because again neither of those stories are true. So what is, so, so, so that, that's, I mean, I don't know whether that's going to be a book, but that, that's what I'm interested in. That's a puzzle for me at the moment that I'm not, I'm interested in finding out the answer to. Awesome. <laughs> Will, thank you so much. Thanks, David. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you for watching all the way to the end. And if you'd like to join conversations like this, check out our digital campfire. You get access to a load of member-only films. You can watch live, ask questions, come to our book club, our wisdom gym sessions and our regular monthly meetups where we share what's going on behind the scenes and you can also connect with other Rebel Wisdom members. What's more, you can also get discounts on our courses like Sensemaking 101. Check out the link below and we'd love to see you soon.